I'm Jono Buchanan, and I've got an invitation for you, which is, do you want to go and get lost in total audio carnage? Well, if you do, keep watching, because what we're going to do is we're going to take a first, no, actually second look at Sample Alchemy. Now, if you tuned in for the 100th episode live, you will know that I spent some time looking at this plugin, um, and so this is our kind of second look at it. But it feels like a bit of a sliding doors moment, this, a kind of parallel universe um, sort of um, sort of plug in this, because from this moment, I have absolutely no idea where we're going to end up in terms of the little sound that I prepared and where it's going to take us on an audio journey. Um, often, as you'll expect, I uh, spend some time thinking about the content we're going to put out in the video and spending some time thinking about the musical examples. Well, exactly what the musical example is going to be that we're going to end up with here, I have no more idea than you have, because Sample Alchemy is a truly remarkable trip down the rabbit hole. Are you coming? Okay, so here is the sound we're going to start with. This part I do know. It goes like this. Okay, so this is a beautiful sign harp. Um, I know that because that's the name of the sound, so, you know, we've got to trust it. Now, what I can do with Sample Alchemy is, even though this is a software instrument within Logic, I can just immediately sample it. I don't have to bounce it down to become an audio file. I can simply just drag it down to the track below, and I can move it left, which gives me the opportunity to sample it in a number of different ways, and the one that we're interested in is Sample Alchemy here. Now, as I release on that, and Logic analyzes it and produces this um, excellent plugin and the graphical waveform, I would really recommend that if you haven't already, you go and watch the section on Sample Alchemy um, that we looked at in the 100th video live. And that's a weird time for me to say that because now you're going to go and do that and then come back to exactly this timestamp. There you go, I paused. Okay, so we're back in. But um, I think that would be a good idea because as I say, um, exactly where we're going to go here is anybody's guess. So what exactly is Sample Alchemy? Well, firstly, as we've already seen, it's a sampler. Um, it is a kind of version of Alchemy that's come across from the iPad, which allows us to play around with up to four separate sound sources, which can select from um, the audio waveform that we brought in to be sampled. So I can see that straight away, what happens when I bring in this sound is that the waveform for the sample, as it's been detected, is displayed within the waveform display. And I can see here that module A, the first of those playback engines, is available to me. What I can also see is that at the moment we're working in what's called classic mode. We're going to look at all of these modes, but this is classic mode. And what classic mode does is to play this sample back from start to finish. And it's going to do this through one of Sample Alchemy's playback engines. Now, often what happens when we think about sampling is that what we want to do is to record a sound and then play it back accurately. We think about orchestral sample libraries. What we want is the sound of those instruments as realistically reimagined through sampling as we can possibly have. Well, that's not really what Sample Alchemy is about. Its sample engines use different resynthesis techniques, either granular additive or spectral resampling. And effectively, these are all synthesis techniques that nevertheless use audio at their core. So to take granular as an example, what happens is that the sound is broken up into literally what we refer to as individual grains, tiny little slices of sound. And what we can do is to choose the size of those individual grains, the density of them, and various other things, which we'll look at in just a moment. And they play back the sound either a little bit more accurately or a little bit less accurately, but with this kind of slightly, well, granular kind of quality to the sound, just all a bit broken up and a bit bitty, if you like. Okay. A lot of chat from me. Let's just press play and you'll hear what classic mode does. It's going to play the entire sample back from start to finish. But of course, I can jump octave. And there's that kind of time stretchy bitty quality that I was talking about. Now, we could spend the whole of this video just looking at the parameters that are available in each individual kind of synthesis engine. And at some point, that would probably be a really good thing for us to do. 
we'll make a note. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to, I'm talking to him like he's, you know, my sort of assistant slave, quite the opposite. Okay, but nevertheless, we will take a deep dive into these because I think they're worth knowing about. But what we will do now is just quickly look at the kind of size of these grains, just so you understand that a little bit better. So effectively, what we've got at the moment is a size set in milliseconds, so how long is each individual slice of audio, and the smaller we make these and the less dense we make playback, the more obvious it will become that this sound is being broken up into different grains. So the more grains we get, the smoother the sound is, and similarly, that's going to be true to some extent for the size of each grain as well. So that gives us a clear opportunity to kind of hear how each of these chunks actually sounds. Okay, so the first thing is we've chosen our granular engine, and at the moment we're in classic playback mode. And yep, yeah, I'm manipulating how the sample is played back by playing it on my keyboard, but I've got some of the normal things we'd expect from a sampler as well. Do I want to play back at the regular speed of the original loop, or do I want to double it, halve it, that kind of thing? I can pan this sound source, I can tune it, and I can fine tune it as well. And I have chosen something which is deliberately a little bit wide from a pitch perspective, a little bit detuned just to see where that takes us. Okay, so that's classic mode. Then we get loop mode. Loop mode allows us to basically, oh, it triggers as I click on it. I always forget that. Okay, so loop mode, don't click, allows me to basically specify a loop around a particular part of the region. So I could specify the entire waveform, in which case we'll get an eight bar loop, or I could select a much shorter section. Now you might be thinking, well, why is the sound changing as I move up and down? Well, what we're manipulating there is grain size and density. So those parameters we just looked at are changing as I move up and down. We can also create um, reverse loops by making the loop point to the left of the source point. Techno time. Okay, so we've got a chance to do that if we want to, and that's absolutely fine, and so that's loop mode. Okay, what is scrub mode? Well, scrub mode gives us an incredibly small little loop. Resistible, isn't it? You can begin to see why this video could be seven days long if we're not careful. So what we get a chance to do with Scrub is to have this incredibly short little loop, which is literally just cycling over a tiny little amount of this waveform, and that's really nice. Um, wouldn't it be nice if we could actually record some of that movement? Spoiler alert! Okay, so Scrub does that for us. What Bo does is to make all of that a little bit bigger, so we get a kind of violinist's approach, if you like. So we get to bow across a slightly larger area of the audio waveform. And the crucial thing about bow is that, like a violinist, we can bow in both directions, so effectively the audio scrubs over a slightly bigger area. And then we get to ARP mode. Now, ARP mode is going to make much more sense when we've got one more than one sound source, because, of course, that's the next thing to say, which is that at the moment we're only listening to one sound source, just one of four potential sound sources. So the obvious thing for me to do now would be to bring in a second sound source, B, for instance, but we're actually not going to do that. We're going to get to that little spoiler alert that I mentioned a moment ago, and we're going to introduce some motion instead. Now that's done up here. What this allows me to do when I press on the motion button is that we're going to have a chance to record some of the movement that I've just been experimenting with. And the way that this works is that I'm literally going to press the record button, I'm then going to trigger a note. And what that's then going to do is to start this little record opportunity, if you like, where I'm going to get a chance to manipulate some of that movement and we'll then see what we can do with it. So what I'm going to do 
So I'm just going to literally play a note and um, we're going to see how movement can be recorded. <laughs> And then when I'm done, what I can do is to let go. Now, what's going to happen now when I press this note back is that we'll see that movement I've recorded. Now, if we look really carefully, you can actually see that in the first two sort of bars of this recording, I didn't make any movement at all. It wasn't until I started picking up that A point and it started moving that we've actually got that movement happening. And at the moment, all of that movement lasts for a slightly awkward 11 and a half bars. Now, one thing I could do, of course, would be to actually re-record this. I can just literally press clear and go back to the beginning. And this time, maybe what I'll do is to run the metronome in the background and I'll try and make sure that my movement makes a bit more syncable sense. That would be one thing that I could do. But the alternative is that I could just select an area that I've recorded and try and make a loop out of that. And I can do that in a couple of different ways. So I can see that overall the duration that I've recorded is 12.79 bars. And as we all know, all of the best loops are 12.79 bars long. Hmm. Not really. So what we're going to do instead is we're going to select an area where the movement exists where I think we want to kind of be creating a bit of a loop. And I think that that's kind of from about bar three to about bar seven. That kind of four bar area is maybe an area that we might want to loop from a um, sort of a musical point of view. So I'm going to make the loop end point at bar seven. I'm going to make the loop start point at bar three. And like a kind of classic sampler, what that's going to mean is that we get the first two bars before we then start looping through that section. And that's quite nice. OK, but I don't want those values. So what I'm actually going to do is to clear my pattern, which is press clear and get rid of it. And then what I'm going to do is to just press record and I'm going to record something a little bit more quickly that moves a little faster. So I'm going to move my A point to where I want it to start. And then as I start recording, we're going to just get some more immediate movement happening over just a couple of bars. So let's set ourselves up. OK, we're going to start here. I'm just going to press the record light to get ready and then we'll go. OK, and I think that's going to give us a slightly tighter four bar loop. So I'm going to set the duration at four bars. And what I'm going to do is to have the loop start in bar one and it's going to therefore end at the beginning of bar five. Remember, four bars. <laughs> OK, and I really like that. Now, the amazing thing is that what I can then do is to come back into play mode. I can select a second sound source, B. I can bring that in. I can find the area that I want to work with B and I can repeat all of that process. So firstly, what I'm going to do is to come and find the bit I want to work with. easy to get lost in the joy of this. So there we are. Here's source B. I'm going to come back to motion. I'm going to re hit record again. And again, within my four bar cycle sequence, I'm going to record some movement for B as well. OK, and now what we've got is this. OK, so I really like this kind of juddery second layer that we've got, but it's too loud relative to the first one. So the next thing I can do is to come to the mixer and what I'm going to do is to turn the volume down of B. So it's just this kind of rattly thing that's happening underneath. And I can repeat the process two more times. I'm going to come back to the play engine, select C. Here is our new layer. I'm going to just turn off the mixer for a second. Let's come and find maybe one of the earlier notes. OK, 
Okay, and I'm going to record some motion for this as well. Okay, and let's have a listen to that. Okay, so we've now got our original loop, which is kind of smoothly moving over this nice area, and then we've got these two rapidly kind of going crazy ones as well. Now, I think the kind of flickeriness of this, which is not entirely what I intended, but something that I really like now that it's actually happening, is um, just to do with the fact that there's lots of processing going on. Um, I don't really know why else that would be happening, and actually I really like this texture, but again, as I mentioned at the beginning of the video, the thing about sample alchemy is that all of these little decisions, all of the tiny variations that could come from exactly where I place the sound sources, how they get recorded from a motion perspective, will just yield a completely different result. If you're trying to say, okay, well actually I'm going to follow exactly every single one of these instructions to the letter, you'll end up with just a totally different sound because all of these changes are just going to be microscopic, but then they're going to get magnified with every new move we make. So because we've got one more sound source, we might as well use it. Let's bring in D. Here it is, and we're going to find a new little area over here as well. Still with me? Okay, what we're going to do is come back into motion, record some uh, some movement for this uh, uh, movement as well, this, uh, this source as well, um, and we'll just see what that gives us. Wow. Okay. Okay, this extraordinary sound. So what we've got is this um, set of, at the moment, sort of scrub movements. But having recorded this collection of motion sequences as well, which are bugging out and doing crazy things as well, and having used the, minix, uh, the mixer to manipulate the volume of each of those, what I can actually do is to change mode if I want to. So what I'm gonna do is to come back into bow mode and see where that takes us. So in bow mode, again, I didn't know this was going to happen. We're going to get one, two beats of relatively smooth movement and then all hell breaks loose. Which is really interesting. And in classic loop mode, oh, okay, back to just two sources. Okay, so we get a, 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 a different kind of effect. Loop mode only allows us to use sources A and B. So we'll get all four back if we come into these other modes. Okay, but what I'm also interested to do is to look at ARP mode. And ARP mode brings in all four sources, but effectively, rather than playing all four at once, it will move from one to another. So it will play one, and then the next, and then the next, and then the next. Now this might be an interesting moment to bring in our original sequence and to run this one underneath it. Okay, and what I'm gonna do is just quantize this for a moment so that it plays back bang in time.
Okay, so this would be a really good time to say, okay, well, obviously one thing I might want to do next, let's just close the mixer down, would be to tune each individual slice. So that one's okay. In fact, like this, they're all going to seem okay. So what I might have to do would be to just click on each individual sound source. And then of course I could use my tuning course and my tune find to get these in tune exactly which sound module is the one that's, or sound source is giving us this kind of crazy uh, sort of set of overtones. It would just be trial and error to experiment with. But actually I quite like the fact that it's a little bit weird like this. Obviously at the moment it's really loud as well. But one thing that we could really experiment with would be to take this ARP sequence and to make it much punchier. What do I mean by that? Well, let's just solo this sound for a second. I'm gonna turn off the transpose for a moment. And what I'm going to do is to think about the um, amp envelope settings, which are up here. So effectively, what I've got is an attack time, which is relatively quick, which is fine. A decay time, which is fine too, but sustain is currently at 100%. And what that means is that each slice then uh, is as loud as it can possibly be. As it moves from one to another, all of them are really loud. If I turn sustain down to zero, then what's going to happen instead is that we're now going to be governed. Each slice is only going to be governed by its attack time and by the decay length and by the release as well. But all of these are quite short. And what that gives us is this. Okay, and now we've got this kind of quite modulary kind of little sequence and all the pitching has gone absolutely nuts and that would need sorting out and effectively this could be the start of a new thing rather than a sort of accompaniment to the original sign heart part. But what we've suddenly got is all of this utter craziness. And as I say, every single decision that I've made has led to a different place. And if I really let my imagination run away with me now, what I would then do would be to say, okay, well, you know what? I'm interested to experiment with different pitches. But I'm also much more interested in seeing where I can take this sound next. What might happen, for instance, if what I wanted to do was to then send it into a reverb, for instance, which is just gonna give me a kind of cloud-like airy, bloomy kind of a treatment for it, where suddenly the sound is just going somewhere totally unexpected.
<laughs> Amazing. Um, what I'm experimenting with there is whether or not the filter should come first and then hit the reverb, or whether or not the reverb should come before the filter so that the reverb shape is incorporated into the way that, that filter is working. Again, we can make a whole video about the order of your plugins and how um, one feeds another. What a creative time we're having. Okay, now what I'm interested to do is to see whether or not in any way this loop can make sense with the original beautiful sign harp which we had at the beginning of this video which was our trigger point. Let's see if there's any way we can make that work. Um, let's listen to this for a moment. Okay, I'm not optimistic about this. Okay, that's kind of horrible. All right, let's see if we can work out why. Well, firstly, why? It's because, remember, we've picked out individual slices from the resampled thing. I've triggered it. We've been playing around with grain sizes, and as a result, pitch has gone absolutely nuts. But this loop does make musical sense. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to fire up a new retrosynth instrument, just as a little picture for us. So our original sign um, harp is in C minor, uh, solo, Jono, I'm in solo mode here. Let's have a listen. So we're in kind of a C minor-y kind of a place. So if I do solo these two parts for a moment. Well, it's a bit pitchy. Okay, so it's kind of those notes. What we need now is a music theory course, which would allow us to work out which notes these might belong to. Hmm. Where could we find one of those? Well, any ideas? Okay, so... Well, it's a bit pitchy, and that original sign part is pitchy, and I mentioned that I really like that, and now we see how that sort of unfolds through sample alchemy. But it's kind of an E major, which also means it will work quite nicely as a C sharp minor. Those notes work well over C sharp minor. And my original beautiful sign harp is in C minor. So in other words, it's a semitone out, which is why it sounds so discordant. So if I were to bring this back in, let's unsolo everything. If I was to transpose this original part up one semitone, it will go from being in C minor to now being in C sharp minor. And I think that that will sound better with this. Amazing. And there we go, we complete our musical journey. Now, there's no doubt that, and it's still pitchy, but I really like that. There is absolutely no doubt that almost everything that's happened in this episode, I couldn't possibly have predicted in terms of which bits we've selected, how they've worked out, the little wonking out of the motion movement, all of that kind of stuff. And suddenly the last thing we've ended up doing is transposing our original part up one semitone to have it fit back in a little bit better with the sound that we've created. And this, in a way, is the perfect um, example of how sample alchemy will just take you to places you're not expecting. And I love that. Often when we're making music, what we want to do is to say, OK, yeah, I want this beat loop and I want it to be at 96 BPM and I know I like that piano plug in and I want to use this reverb treatment that I've used before. In other words, we want to make music and we want our technology to allow us to work at the speed that we want to work in the way that we want to work. And that's great. Every once in a while, what we want to do is to come down to our studios and have our technology reward us with complete surprise. And Sample Alchemy is the living embodiment of that um, approach. In fact, I would go so far as to say it's almost impossible for it to do the thing that you're expecting it to do completely. Yes, you have control over it, but you're going to get driven by 
different creative choices when you work with this plugin and I think there's a lot to be said for that. So if you are as seduced by the idea of your technology rewarding you creatively in this way as I am, then I think Sample Alchemy will be a really interesting plugin for you to get lost in, just as I have today.